This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Michael Oren. He is Israel's former ambassador to the United States, a former Knesset member, and a deputy minister in the prime minister's office. He is the author of Ally, My Journey Across the American-Israeli Divide, Power, Faith, and Fantasy, America in the Middle East, 1776 to Present, and Six Days of War, June 1967, and the Making of the Modern Middle East. You can check out his Substack Clarity, and follow him on Twitter at Dr. Michael Oren. And now... Without further ado, Michael Oren. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Okay, I'm happy to be here with you. Where are you? So I'm in Park City, Utah. So uh, just outside of Salt Lake here. Wow, wow, wow. We're in rainy New York City here. Rainy. Okay, okay. Oh, you're in the thick of it then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, behind enemy lines. Uh, well, let's uh, <laughs> let's kick off and jump uh, and jump right in. Sure. Please go. Uh, well, first off, uh, I thank you for this. Um, and I used it in research for my uh, previous two novels. So I uh, really appreciate you writing this book right here. I'd like to talk a little bit about it as we, we move forward here. But, uh, but thank you so much. Uh, everybody should go out and get six days of war. Um, and uh, it really does help give a uh, build a foundation to understand what's going on today in Israel and then our relationship thereof. But I have to ask first off, your path to becoming the Israel's ambassador to the U.S. How did how did that transpire? How did you become the uh, the ambassador? <laughs> That's in another book. You want to get that one's called Ally: uh, My Journey Across the American Israel Divide. The whole story. It actually starts when I was a kid growing up in a in a tough Italian neighborhood, getting beaten up for being a Jew. And uh, my my dad, who was a uh, World War II veteran, had landed in Normandy. Uh, he and his brother who fought across Europe, and they uh, took pictures of, of a concentration camp. And uh, I'd come home all bloody, and my father would show me the pictures of the bodies. I actually carry them in my cell phone, these pictures. I still have them. Um, that he would say, you know, you see that? You see those pictures? You see those bodies? That's why we need a strong state of Israel. And it had a big impact to me. So um, I started going. I was 15 and uh, working on a farm. And uh, I don't know, wasn't much of a farmer, but I tried very much. I was a cowboy, by the way. I was a cowboy on horseback, and uh, but I loved it. And uh, I joined a, a youth movement, and we went to Washington D.C. and I met with the Israel ambassador to uh, the United States back then. I shook his hand and I said, "That's what I want to be when I grow up." And the ambassador's name was uh, Yitzhak Rabin, and later I would become advisor to Yitzhak Rabin. And so I, I really sort of geared my whole path in life to read realizing that vision. So what I studied in college and, and learning to, you know, be in the press and interview on TV. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm talking to you from Columbia University here about to give a talk to students. Uh, this is where I studied. I studied Middle Eastern studies here. Uh, later on, I'll be on CNN tonight. So I learned how to interview on TV, all these tools I had required in order to be ambassador. And I just happened to be the right place at the right time because in 2009, um, Barack Obama had become president, uh, and the prime minister felt that they needed somebody who understood America very well and understood that America very well. It's a certain America. Um, and so I got the job, and um, it was a heck of a job. I bet. I'm going to go read that, that uh, your, your book because I'm so fascinated yeah, by yeah. that journey, and I, I hope everyone else does as well. Um, but bringing us up to today, I want to go into some history because I know you are so well versed on all of this. Um, but uh, just this morning, I read about the UN Human Rights Chief, uh, interesting title, called for an investigation into bombing in Gaza to Israel's side, obviously. Um, and my my question is, why is it, and it's so obvious, that Israel is held to such a different standard than any other country uh, in the world when it comes to its defense? There's this one word, it's anti-Semitism, because Israel's the Jewish state. I mean, you know, I think America had every right to, to defend itself against Al-Qaeda, every right to defend itself against uh, ISIS. Uh, during the course of those campaigns, whether in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria, America killed many, many thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of civilians, many thousands of, of, uh, of children, um, but nobody said anything. Um, and nobody said, no one said America was acting disproportionately at any time. 
Um, America's held to a different standard. Certainly, you know, a country like Syria, which, which massacres half a million of its own people, is not held to a different standard. So there's actually three different standards. There's the standard for non-democratic nations, the standard for democratic nations, and the standard for Israel, which is very different. And um, I have been involved, you know, in government at various levels. And I always say to, my, to people in government, I said, you know, we can sit there and cry about it, but this is who we are. We might as well just own up to it. Doesn't mean we can we can't fight back. We can fight back. We have to fight back. But to understand that we are facing a completely different set uh, of criteria than any other country. Yeah, it's fascinating, and it's so it's it's so obvious. If it wasn't obvious before, it should be now to anyone paying attention. Uh, and related to that, calls for a ceasefire um, or calls for pauses uh, from very vocal portions of uh, of the United States, the campus that 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 you're on, student yep. movements, uh, protests around the world, uh, members of the United States Congress. When you hear that, and I know you have to go on CNN and you go on MSNBC and Fox, and they ask you this this question, um, what are and your they thoughts? Do. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, do. they do. But yeah. uh, I mean, and it does relate to Israel being held to a to a different standard. But um, and you're going to probably have to keep answering that that same question in the weeks and and months ahead. But when you first heard ceasefire, you probably weren't surprised. Were you surprised at how quickly calls for ceasefire came? No. No, no, actually, I was surprised it took as long as it did. Oh, really? Uh, I did, yeah, because, you know, we had 1,400 uh, people killed in just over 24 hours, and it was also the way they were killed. They weren't just, you know, taken out and shot. They were mutilated and beheaded and raped and burnt, and 240, over 240 of our citizens taken hostage, people ranging from, you know, 85 years old Holocaust survivors to nine month old baby uh, taken hostage. So this is this was an outrage which mirrored to the unknown in the modern period. So that gained us a certain amount of sympathy. And I knew that there'd be a certain amount of days when the world would be us would be with us. And then after a while, uh, certainly as we began to strike back and we're up against a an enemy Hamas that uses its own population as human shields, we would be killing these people and we'd be blamed for it. And um, and this is this is a process I've seen recurring throughout many wars and some of which I've, I've participated in. So I saw it up close, uh, a little bit old for it now, but uh, wish I weren't, wish I was there now. Um, but so I was used to that. So not, so now we have the calls for the ceasefire and, and it's, you know, ceasefire is a great word. It's a very positive word. You hear ceasefire. Why wouldn't people want a ceasefire? You know, people are shooting each other. People are dying. Why wouldn't you want a ceasefire? And the answer to this is this. Now, a ceasefire means um, basically one thing. It means, it means Hamas wins. Right? Hamas gets away with mass murder. That's why Hamas wants a ceasefire. Hamas, that's, that's their demand. You know, hey, we'll give you a couple of hostages, get a ceasefire. That means they win. And if they win, that means that the 250,000 Israelis who have been driven from their homes by this war will not be able to go back to their homes. Nobody, the whole southern part of the country will not be in ha won't be a ha a habitable. The northern part of the country, which is which is threatened by Hezbollah, also won't be habitable. You wouldn't go raise your kids there, you know, next to a border, where you know, that Hamas is just re reorganizing and rearming itself. Never. And preparing the next attack. And by the way, they say, they say, if when this ends, we're going to start the next attack and the next attack and the next attack. They're never going to stop. Not like they're hiding their intention. It, so it also means that all of Israel's enemies in the region will internalize that they can hit us, they can attack us, and when we go to defend ourselves, the international community will tie our, our hands with a ceasefire, which means, frankly, we're dead. So a ceasefire for Israel means death. It means, it, it's, it's just, I don't care what kind of pressure we're going to be under, I don't care who's demanding it, Israel simply cannot agree to a ceasefire and survive. It's that simple. And, you know, we understand it, we internalize it, um, and we're willing to pay whatever price it's required because we really have no choice. Yeah. And it seems like there are two layers of shields for Hamas. They're, they're civilian population, putting headquarters buildings under hospitals and, and things like that. Uh, and then the hostages, and yep. many of whom are foreign citizens, French citizens, U.S. citizens. Um, and it seems like we're not hearing as much about the hostages as we have in past conflicts for whatever whatever reason. Um, but is the Hamas strategy strategy with hostages different than past conflicts when they have a single Israeli soldier or a few Israeli teenagers or whatever it, it might be? And was that intentional or did they take too many, thinking that they were going to just be successful in grabbing a few and they end up with over a hundred. 
it's not so certain whether Hamas succeeded beyond its expectations. There's a school of thought that says, yes, they didn't, extend, they didn't get, expect to get this many hostages. Uh, on the other hand, we're, we're now reading into some of the war plans that have fallen into our hands through uh, dead terrorists. And it looks like their, their goals were much more extensive. They wanted to take over Israeli cities. They wanted to take over Air Force bases. Um, so it, it, we don't know yet. What is clear was that when the Hamas terrorists broke to the gate, thousands of Gazans who are not Hamas terrorists also broke through the gate. Mm. And so not all of the hostages are in Hamas's hands. Some of them are in the hands of another Palestinian terrorist organization known as Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It's wholly owned and operated by Iran. And some hostages are in the hands of families. They have the family hostage and they're holding on to the hostage to sell the hostage. And, and they've done this in the past. Now, this vastly, vastly complicates our, our military operations uh, for the simple reason. Hamas has beneath the city of Gaza, beneath Gaza generally, it has hundreds of miles of tunnels. And some of these tunnels go down hundreds of feet. And big problem is, is identifying where the hostages are. And we, don't, we think that even Hamas doesn't even know where the Hamas, all the hostages are. They don't. So the obvious way to deal with the tunnels would be to flood them with seawater or to flood them with some flammable substance, you know, throwing a match. Uh, we can't do that because of the hostages. We just don't know where they are. And we're unwilling to sort of give them up. So we're going to have to use all of our technology and all of our um, military ability. We have special forces who are trained to do this, both in tunnel funding, fi fighting and, and Hosky rescue, um, to do our best to try to get these, to try to rescue these hostages. Yeah. And, uh, the Knesset. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Israeli political system for those who keep hearing yeah. this word and uh, might not know exactly what it means, equate it to our Congress or whatever. Uh, you were a member of the, the Knesset and a deputy minister to the prime minister. Could you give us, uh, explain the Israeli political system that uh, at times is is quite volatile before this attack, uh, right. was divided over the judicial reforms. Uh, what is the Knesset and how, it is, how does the Israeli government operate? Well, our system is, is closer to the, say, the, the British and German system than it is to the American system, your presidential system. Uh, we have a president, but slowly, it's largely a ceremonial job. Um, the, the president as the president of the United States is the, head of, is the head of state, but the prime minister is the head of government. So what you do is you have people vote for parties. And there, there are a lot of parties, like 13 different parties. There's right, there's very right, there's left, there's very left, there's religious, there's very religious, there's Arab, uh, all different parties. You vote for a party, uh, the man who's head or woman who's head of that party then gets it, if they win, they go into an agreement with a coalition with other parties. And the party that, ha that has most votes usually gets to elect the prime minister. And the prime minister puts together that, that coalition. Um, and... There are 120 members of, of Knesset. There can be as many as 40 ministers. Uh, and like in the United States, we have an independent judiciary. Uh, we have a balance of powers. We do not have a constitution. We have a collection of basic laws, which is very similar to the British system uh, that acts like a constitution. And before this war, we were very divided, very divided over a, a government proposal to alter the balance of power between the various branches of government by giving the, the government more power over the judiciary. Uh, strangely enough, it was actually to make it look much more like the American system, because uh, in America, you, you, you wonderful people get to choose. You have two options, two ways of influ influencing the composition of your Supreme Court. You vote for president and you vote for the Senate. We didn't have that because the uh, Supreme Court judges are pretty much chosen by other Supreme Court judges. And um, and that's a very bizarre system. And the government wanted to change it. Many people in the population um, saw this as a type of a coup. It would give uh, the government unlimited powers. So we really had a battle over democracy. And it was in many ways a very um, beautiful battle because people came out to the street in the hundreds of thousands, you know, waving the flag and singing our national anthem. And they came out in, in defense of democracy. Um, and then the government had its supporters as well. And many things happened. Um, Reservists, we have a big you know, reserve army. We're saying they wouldn't report for duty if these judicial reforms went through, including pilots. And now people on the right are saying, well, that's one of the reasons Hamas attacked us. Uh, people on the left are saying um, that the government didn't heed the warnings that the judicial review was 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 making Israel vulnerable by dividing us. Um, so when this is all over, when the smoke clears, even when the smoke clears, we're going to have to deal with all these issues again. So that's our system. Um, in many ways, it's it's more democratic than the American system. In many ways, it's less democratic than the American system. 
Um, we have a very tight uh, cap on giving to parties. You can only give twenty six hundred dollars to a party. You don't have super PACs here, mm -hmm. and uh, and the, and you know election cycle lasts three year three months instead of three years. So <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> what do you do with all your free time? I don't know, actually kind of try to govern. We we protest. So those are the differences. But it is it, actually last point. And this is an interesting point, Jack. And that you know you can probably count on one hand. The countries in the world that have never known a second of non-democratic governance. Okay, it's the United States, Great Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Israel's on that list. We've never, we're one of those rare countries, never known a, a second of non-democratic governance. And we're the only country on that list that's never known a moment of, moment of peace. So that's very rare to have democracies that stand up under that type of pressure again and again and again. And so it, I think democracies, in many ways, are our greatest accomplishment. And on that same same line, um, Israel's founding in May of 1948, we have 47 into 48 right there, um, just very soon after the end of World War II. And essentially, it seems like there was a, a promise to Israeli citizens um, that the Holocaust would never happen again. This was the place to go. And in exchange for that, uh, there was an investment, an investment that in the United States, it's very clear that we don't make with our with our youth anymore. Um, and that investment is, well, military service in many cases, higher taxes, I believe. Um, and there's a higher cost of living, a volatile political system that you just described. But that promise was to keep the Israeli people, the Jewish people, safe. And as you mentioned, there has really not been a second of peace. And you talk about uh, that in your book here um, uh, as well. But can you take us back to those founding days in uh, 1947, 1948, that promise to Israeli citizens, uh, to, to Jewish people, and of Israel uh, living up to that promise in many cases? Go back to that date. It was May 14th, 1948. Israel declared its independence. That was almost three years to the date after the end of World War II. It's three years after the end of the Holocaust in which one of every three Jews in the world was murdered. And that's amazing that you come back, back after three years. And even then, there were only, uh, back then, only 600,000 Jews uh, in, in Israel. They're about the size of the population of Boston today. And the army said that we had enough bullets to fight for one week. And they had no planes, no tanks, and you we were going to be invaded by six Arab armies that had a lot of planes, a lot of tanks. And they invaded. They almost took Tel Aviv. They almost took Jerusalem. Uh, One percent of the population was killed. Now, that that's extraordinary. That's a very, very high percentage. That would be equivalent today of something like, what would be, 330,000 uh, um, Americans killed in a few months. And um, But we were able to drive those Arab armies back and declare the state. Um, but then we had to fight war after war after war after that. We fought a war in 56, we fought a war in 67, in 73, um, in 82, and, uh, and then a series of terrorist wars, uh, what we call the Second Intifada, um, which killed a thousand Israelis, and then several wars, both with Hezbollah in the north and with, God, with Hamas in the south. So, um, you know, I started my military service before the 82 war. So I was in the, uh, the siege of Beirut in 1982. So I've been in a lot of these wars and our kids have been in wars. So uh, we uh, are, but it's a very, you should know, it's a very different army. Uh, we don't salute. We don't march. We don't call our officers by their first names. If we like them, we call them by their last names. <laughs> I love that. And, and they mean it. And, um, and, it, 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 and we have reserve duty. So I did reserve duty for 35 years and um, I'm a reserve major. And um, you know, you basically a citizen soldier all the time. I was one point spending one out of every day in the week in the military. So now we've called up 360,000 reservists. That's huge. That's the size of the army that George Bush sent into Iraq in 2003. And, yeah. um, and they were fighting. I have two assistants uh, who are fighting now tonight. They're both uh, paratroopers in, in Gaza. I don't know where they are. They don't, we're not in touch with them. And so many of our friends have, you know, sons and daughters who are out fighting tonight. Yeah, and it and it, it's interesting in that you talk about Israel and what it's had to endure since its inception. Um, and most people don't think too often of uh, of anything more international, but there are, are one of the most audacious 
special operations missions of the 20th century is the raid on Entebbe in July 4th, 1976. Jonathan Netanyahu is killed there, of course. Um, uh, Ethiopian Jews getting them out in the sixth in the 1980s. Uh, the capture of Adolf Eichmann in May of 1960. So there are these uh, these international um, uh, missions that Israel has uh, undertaken uh, without a lot of the resources that uh, that other countries have. Uh, and they're in many they're in their case studies uh, going forward. Um, but also wanted to touch base with you on how those wars, the ones that we just mentioned built the foundation of a modern Israel. And there was up to October 7th, um, from, from my perspective, and I think a lot of others, there was this mystique surrounding uh, the Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence service, because of those special operations missions or intelligence missions that I've just mentioned, and how they have defended themselves as a country against larger forces with uh, technology that Israel didn't have back then. Um, has that mystique, I mean, it's taken a, a hit, obviously, but what do you see uh, going, and what is the, more importantly, what has the enemy learned from uh, maybe they had some similar type of conceptions about the military in Israel and the intelligence service in Israel? What has this taught the enemy October 7th um, when they look at uh, whether a failure of gaps um, in the Israeli defenses and intelligence services? Well, as far as the enemy goes, the, the, the lessons they'll draw will are, are a little bit a little bit in the future because uh, when they're wiped out, <laughs> if there's anyone left standing, they'll have a lesson that maybe this wasn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. For us, the lessons will be this: we were heavily dependent on technology. Now think about America on September 10th, 2001. Right? Here's you have a country with you know hundreds of nuclear weapons as the most advanced technology in the world, a huge army, and yet you know what was it? 19 guys with two airplanes. Um, conduct probably the most successful terrorist act in the world and, and take down you know two towers in the city in which I'm I'm speaking. So we're well, dealing with an enemy that knows how to go literally under the radar uh, in, with low tech, and so they attacked us here with basically you know guns that shot out cameras and uh, and uh, pliers that pulled out wires for communications, and they attacked us with motorcycles, with motorcycles, and we had spent. You know, a fortune in, in technologically, in, in applying te technology to guard our borders. And uh, the technology proved ineffective when you're dealing with, with, a, a, with a, an, an enemy, which is basically dealing with sort of early 20th century means, you know, motorcycles and, and, and pliers. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing, too, the same thing true happened on 9 11. Uh, so there is a the, the lesson you have to do is not be reliant on technology. Don't let the technology think that that's going to that's going to protect you because it's not. Um, especially if you're dealing with you know terrorist groups, uh, that's a big lesson. So yes, certainly our 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 prestige, our reputation on the world have taken a hit. We're going to have to restore that, and it's going to take a long time to restore that. Listen, it took us a long time to restore our reputation after the 1973 war. And I just recall the 1973 war began almost 50 years to the date before this war, October 6, 1973, began with a massive surprise attack by Egypt and Syria. Our intelligence did not predict that, or if it did predict it, 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 it received warnings but didn't heed them. And, uh, and we lost uh, something equivalent to about 2,800 uh, soldiers in three weeks, which in American terms would be hundreds of thousands. And, um, but at the end of the war, we... Our soldiers um, uh, had surrounded the entire Egyptian army, uh, which was required. It got our water from them. They would have they would have died of thirst. And our our artillery was in gun range of, of Damascus. Now, I, as ambassador, I used to visit the American military academies, and it was interesting. They they didn't used to study the Six Day War. They studied the Seventy Three War, because for America, you know, America a lot often begins wars at a disadvantage. Uh, Fort Sumter, um, Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and these were intelligence failures. They were, especially Pearl Harbor, big intelligence failure. But you don't judge World War II by Pearl Harbor, right? You judge Pearl, you know, World War II by you know, VE Day <laughs> the, or VJ Day. And World War II is a great victory. Um, in Israel, a little bit difficult. We, we look at that first day of the October War rather than the last day of the Yom Kippur War and say, okay, it was, it's that type of defeat. I think with this war, it's going to be very similar. I th I'm, I'm confident that we will defeat Hamas, we'll uproot Hamas, um, because we have no choice. 
Um, but I think that this war will remain a uh, deeply scarring in the Israeli consciousness for generations to come, not years to come, generations to come. Yeah. And it seems to look from the outside looking in that Israel has uh, exercised enormous restraint over the years with this policy of containment, acceptable levels of violence coming out of Gaza and coming out of uh, Lebanon with Hezbollah in the north. Um, and that, Paul, and it seems like when we, all these wars we've talked about, Israel has bought time between the wars and bought time until there's another one, bought a little time with some acceptable level of violence until the next one. What changes going forward? We did. We paid them all. And, you know, we talked earlier about that covenant that the state of Israel came to be in 1948 with that promise that the second Holocaust wouldn't happen, that the state would protect its citizens from atrocities. And the state, what can I say, let the citizens down on October 7th. And the state's going to have to restore the people's confidence um, because that goes to the, the heart of that, that covenant, okay, that agreement, that contract. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us, a lot of work. And when you look back to 2005, 2006, 2007, specifically in Gaza with the election of Hamas and then what amounts to essentially a Palestinian civil war between uh, between those factions. Uh, what do you look at from a policy perspective that maybe should have been done differently back then in seeing what has transpired over the last 15 plus oh, years? The, the, the mistakes, <laughs> it's like take a number, there were so many mistakes. So the mistake by the, uh, by the Bush administration, by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, to excuse me, insist that Hamas be able to run in the elections. And the United States insisted that a terrorist organization run the elections. And of course, the terrorist organization won. Um, Israel said, don't do it, don't do it. And they made us do it. And they won. Uh, in the Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, uh, the PLO wouldn't let Hamas take over. But in uh, Gaza, Hamas staged a, a coup and killed hundreds of uh, PLO Palestinians, threw them off the top of roofs. And they created a terrorist state, and that terrorist state immediately started, you know, shelling us. So that that's one mistake, you know, getting Hamas in the election. Another mistake was our withdrawal from Gaza. So we withdrew from Gaza in 2005. Uh, I was in that operation as well as a reserve officer. Very traumatic. Many, many ways more traumatic than the war I was ever in, because I had to go in and rip fellow citizens out of their homes and carry them out screaming. And then bulldozers came and bulldozers, tw bulldozed 27, 21 communities. Just laid them flat and we pulled out and we thought we'd be giving the palestinians a chance to uh, experiment with 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 sovereignty with with independence they'd have a little mini state let's see how they do um and the people in the government back then says anybody thinks that that's going to become a terrorist state is, is crazy they should have their heads examined well it turns out what who should have their heads examined <laughs> and uh immediately became a terrorist so it was that mistake as well and then for many years we as we we didn't reply sufficiently to the rocket fire and then finally, we got into the business of paying off Hamas. And you mentioned this. And this was, yeah, you know, we got a deal going with the Qataris that they would bring in money. And I was in the government then. And I saw these pallets of money. I mean, you can't imagine how much money was going in there. Stacks of, of uh, greenbacks. And, um, and then we also let Palestinian workers from the Gaza Strip into Israel, about 20,000 workers. It turned out these workers mapped all of our communities. So the terrorists, when they broke through the door, through the, through the fence, they knew exactly where to go. They knew who lived in every house. They knew, the, they knew, they had the layouts of our military bases. And uh, so that's not going to happen again. <laughs> it's not going to happen for a long time. So the question yeah. is, we have to learn from all these different mistakes here. Yeah. And I, uh, when we talk about that money going <laughs> in, um, that financial aid going in, U.S., from Europe, um, and it, and I don't think Israel put up too much of a fight against that aid going in from my the contrary. We want it. Yeah, we want yeah, it. Uh, exact opposite, right? We charged Gaza for a, a year and a half from the government. And my, my assignment was to try to improve the quality of life for Gazans under the assumption that that would give Hamas something to lose. But it turned out that Hamas didn't care anything for its people, nothing. They didn't even care about the Qatari cash. I care about one thing, and that was killing us. That's it. Yeah, very clear in the in the charter. Um, and if 9-11 taught the United States anything, is that when someone says they're at war with you, uh, they just might mean it. You might want to pay pay attention, especially when they say it more than more than once and very, very clearly. Um those so I understand also there's a there's an aquifer under under Gaza that uh, all that money be. so used to, to be. Uh, 
it, the, 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 every every irrigation pipe that went into Gaza uh, was used to make rockets, and these then they they dug these tunnels down hundreds of feet and they drained the aquifer and the aquifer filled up with salt water, so there's no water in Gaza. Hmm. No water. We were giving Gazans a bit of water. About 7% of their water was coming from us. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Hamas destroyed the water system. And, uh, and the people got to come and blame us, but we had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, how much does Israel need the United States, whether it's financial support or uh, purchase of military equipment? Um, it seems like almost everything Israel has, they could do in Israel, except for planes and helicopters, maybe those sorts of things. But a lot of the other things seems like it seems like if, if there was no aid coming from the US, that Israel would continue would would still do what it needs to do in in Gaza. From your perspective, how much aid from the United States is necessary is not the right word, but how much does Israel need to do what it needs to do both in Gaza and then possibly in the north and maybe even in the, the West Bank at some point? So in theory, you know, we can defend ourselves by ourselves. There's actually a commitment by Congress called QME, Qualitative Military Edge, which the United States government has um, committed to enable Israel to defend itself by itself against any Middle Eastern adversary or any combination of Middle Eastern adversaries. So that's a quote. Um, and so we can, but can we do it as well as we could, you know, without American aid? The answer is no. Uh, one of the things we always need America for is ammunition, is, is resupply. Um, mm -hmm. Underneath the state of Israel are warehouses that were built earlier in the century to service American forces in the Middle East. And they contain about $2 billion worth of pre-positioned military equipment, including arms, including ammunition. And uh, every, every war we've had, I mean, starting the, the second Lebanon in 2006, uh, we've had to go and get permission from the United States to get the keys, as we say, the keys to the warehouse. Go in the warehouses, we take out what we need, we write it down, we pay for it. Um, my guess is we're going to be low, running low on certain types of ammunition uh, as this war rains on. And then if a second front wave breaks out in the north to Hezbollah, we're going to need an awful lot of ammunition. Um, things we run short of is everything from 155 millimeter shells to JDAM rockets. Um, and, you know, they're always in short supply. And now they're particularly in short supply because of Ukraine. And there have been reportedly hundreds of thousands of shells taken out of those warehouses and shipped off to Ukraine. So uh, there's a worldwide shortage in the West of, uh, of munitions. Interesting. But carrier battle groups going into the, the Med, I think there's one in uh, maybe the Red Sea right now. I wouldn't be surprised if something's heading into the, the Persian Gulf, um, obviously, to put pressure on Iran and Hezbollah uh, by proxy uh, to stay out of this, to let Israel deal with, with Gaza. Um, how effective is that in uh, pressuring Iran to stay out now and through Iran, Hezbollah? Um, without those there, would it be a different battlefield right now? Yeah, maybe. We don't know, you know, because the question is whether Hezbollah is going to open up that second front. And Hezbollah as a force in, uh, in Lebanon is roughly 15 times bigger than Hamas. Um, Hamas probably has about 10,000 rockets now, maybe 15,000 rockets. I probably 10. Hezbollah has about 150,000 rockets. And they're bigger rockets, they're bigger, they're longer range, and some of them are guided, which Hamas doesn't have guided rockets and has standoff rockets. They go up, they go down, you know, we shoot them with Iron Dome. Um, and with all of our systems, we have a multi-layered anti-missile system. It's Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow 2, Arrow 3. We've used them all now in this conflict. But if we're getting hit by four to 6,000 rockets a day, those systems will be overwhelmed. And... Um, so the, the carrier fleets, the strike forces, have a lot of different systems aboard. They have a, a THAAD system, an Aegis system, a Patriot system that can take down rockets. So defensively, uh, these forces will be very critical. Um, the big question is, will they be used offensively? And, you know, there's probably only one issue in, in Washington that receives bipartisan support today, and that is the, the unwillingness to get involved in another Middle East war, and uh, right? And uh, oh, American forces are fighting today already because Iran, through its proxies, through militias, through terrorist groups, are firing at American bases in Iraq and Syria. America is sending warplanes to hit back at them. Um, Iran and his brother are playing a very dangerous game. 
they're shooting at Americans, they're shooting at Israel along the, along the top, but they're not going all out for war. Now they're doing this because they have to maintain their prestige, okay? Keep in mind, these Hezbollah and Iran are Shiite. Hamas is Sunni, they hate each other. So now the word's gonna get out to the Middle East that the Sunni Arabs are willing to fight the Jews, but the Shiites are cowards. So they're trying to show that they're not cowards on one hand, but not show their ca cowards enough that would precipitate a war with the United States of America. And it's a very dangerous game. And all you need, Jack, is one drone, one missile to hit an American destroyer or to hit, you know, bullseye in some American base. And you've got a different ballgame. Yeah. And I saw this morning Iran's foreign minister warned that the, he said, I think he said the expansion of the Israel Hamas war has now become inevitable. And I guess the question is, well, how far into the future is it, uh, uh, is the expansion inevitable? Um, he could be talking about, uh, Deal, they're dealing with Hamas and then uh, then Hezbollah, they'll deal with Hezbollah, which will allow us then to defend ourselves and have this war in the north uh, with the support of Iran. Um, but uh, when you saw that, when you saw that Iran's foreign minister saying something like that, uh, is that a warning to the to the U.S. and those uh, those assets that we just talked about or to Israel to uh, to to not defend itself in the north in the short term? Or what, is, what do you what do you take away from Iran's foreign ministers? Stay they there. say it all the time. They say it every, every week, twice a week, that they want to destroy us and wipe us off the map. Nothing unusual about that. Um, uh, I think you know, he is trying to say that if we launched an attack against Hezbollah, that that would transfer, you know, transform the, the localized war in, in Gaza to something more regional. And that's true. But having said that, you're, you're talking to you know, Mr. Warmonger here because uh, earlier in the war, the first week of the war, I published an article, uh, both in English and in Hebrew, saying that uh, we should contain Hamas. Hamas is not going anywhere. Hamas was trapped. And we could continue pounding Hamas from the air, from the sea to the ground, but we really should focus our, our energies on Hezbollah because we had the Americans there in the form of these strike carry strike groups. We had the 360,000 reservists called up. And... You know, the Hamas threat to the northern part of the country, not just, they have rockets that hit the southern part of the country, is just intolerable. It's intolerable for any country. And I don't know how we can ever develop our country if people feel that they're living under Hezbollah rockets all the time. Um, and so this was an opportunity to, to deal Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, uh, a mortal blow. And then when we, you know, take our time and turn around and then, then hit Hamas, because I, I really don't see another alternative. Now, when I first came out with this article, a couple of people laughed at me, but later on, three weeks later, that was the position of the Israeli army, of the Israel Defense Forces, that we should be focusing on Hezbollah first. Mm -hmm. And the government turned it down. The government of Netanyahu turned it down uh, for whatever reasons, perhaps under American pressure too. Um, but I, I don't see how we coexist with this very easily. The question is how long... Do you wait until they have 200,000 rockets pointed to Israel, 300,000 rockets, 500,000 rockets? At what point do you take out that threat to the north? Yeah. Uh, were you shocked? And we you talked about your, your upbringing, and obviously you have been involved uh, in, uh, in Israeli and uh, U.S. relations for your, your whole life and studying this. So I know you weren't surprised by the anti-Semitism or the anti-Israeli uh, calls, these calls for ceasefires we talked about earlier. Uh, every time I talk about Israel on the podcast, the comment section, it's not surprising to me that I, there are all these hateful com pro-Hamas comments uh, in, the co in the comments section, but the number did surprise me. I'm not surprised by very much anymore, but the magnitude of these comments did surprise me. Uh, and then when you look at it holistically across the board and look at these college campuses and you look at uh, protests in Sydney calling, saying gas, chanting gas the Jews, and you look at uh, protests in at Paris and Berlin and London and New York and Washington, D.C., um, were a Molotov cocktail, I think yesterday or the day before was thrown at a synagogue in Montreal of all of all places. I think a Jewish man died after being beaten in Ventura, California. Um, were you surprised by just how open people are in supporting Hamas in the West? The numbers, not that there was support, but how much or were you not surprised? I was shocked, but not but not surprised. <laughs> shocked, but not surprised. Yeah, I, I knew this was out there. It went, it's important to keep this in mind. Um, this is not a war between Israel and Hamas. 
And it's not even a war between Israel and the Palestinians. It's a war between civilization and, and darkness and evil. And my guess is if you took a poll of the people who are supporting Hamas and asked them what they thought about America and what they thought about Western civilization, I think they'd probably say the same thing. They'd probably say they hate America, they hate Western civilization. And that's really, in a very fundamental, deep level, this is what it's about. And uh, I profoundly believe uh, that what Israel is fighting for uh, in Gaza is not just for our own survival and our own security, but for the but for for, for for civilization generally. And you know, people, some people get this in Europe particularly. It's interesting because you know there they have very large, you know, um, sort of extremist populations, Muslim populations, and they understand. Certainly, the French understand that if we lose this, they're next. They're next. And that's a hard message to get across, you know, in America. But who, you don't think these people won't come for you next? <laughs> they'll come for you next That's if they, the see they beat us they see that they beat us why why would they stop why would they stop so it, it really is that sense so you know next time they call ask ask Pope, you know maybe do a canvas them a little questionnaire there what do you think of, i know what you think of israel what do you think of america right right well that the uh the enemy is very clear on killing the saturday people first and the sunday people next uh oh. it's not uh it's not a question on the other side that's for sure um and I know you go on these different news programs and you you write uh, op eds. Um, were you surprised by the New York Times uh, and their coverage of the uh, rocket that missile that landed in the parking lot of the hospital? Were you surprised at their coverage of it, or but when you look back at let's say the manipulation of the media uh, or the complicity even of a lot of people in the media. Um, go back back to 2006. I think there was, what, nine children killed on a beach in Gaza. Uh, Israel was blamed for that. It ended up being Hamas. Um, I think in 2008, there was, a, there was, they said an Israeli mortar landed and killed these people. It, was, it wasn't even Israel. Were you surprised at uh, these large news organizations that um, covered that particular event or as a whole, uh, the way that they're covering it? Um, again, um, shocked but not surprised. Uh, yeah. Dealing with this for many, many years, and uh, you know that uh, the New York Times is is again. You think about what what they think about America too and Western civilization. It's just it, it's deeply corrupted, and and it's it's a shame because you really need that type of press. Um, it's deeply corrupted, and um, this has gone on for a long time, a long time. And the New York Times and uh, the New Yorker and the New York Review books anything pretty much has new york in the title is it, it are systematically systematically out to delegitimize us it's, it's something it, it's something it's something it's something, again it's, it's fundamental it's not just coverage it's saying we actually don't have a legitimate right to defend ourselves and that's the message they're trying to get across and that for us is an existential message we can't defend ourselves we're dead and so you know the the press actually becomes a, a combatant in a way on the other side uh, on the other hand i've been um heartened by some of the some of the fair coverage I, I do a lot of cnn uh and i think the cnn's coverage well you know not perfect has been generally much better than it has been in previous conflicts in 2014 i was actually the cnn analyst for the middle east and i i, I resigned i couldn't i couldn't bear it when the coverage was so bad uh wow. it was so bad uh but now i'm back i'm not as an analyst but i'm, I'm on today i'm on again today and um you know, I feel like I, I get a fair shake. Not that they're easy questions. You're always going to get the question, you know, how can you kill women and children? How can you kill women and children? You're going to give the same answer. We're not killing them. How is it killing them? And, um, you know, why don't you care about the hostages? Why are you invading Gaza if you care about the hostages? Because the answer is we're invading Gaza because we care about the hostages, because that is the best chance we have for getting them out is by putting, is, is tightening the noose around Hamas and forcing them to maybe, you know, give up some of these hostages. Um, but you have to deal with that all the time. And I don't think I'm gonna win hearts and minds. I don't think, you know, someone who hates Israel or hates Jews, I, my being on CNN is not gonna convince them. What I can do, I think, is gain time and space for our army to defend us. Because that's what we need, on the face. We, we need to fight against the international pressure on leaders to impose a ceasefire. Simple as that. And uh, so we all do our bit. Um, I'd rather be back in uniform, but you know. <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, I but I know that. too. That's the thing. I still fit into that uniform. But <laughs> good for you. <laughs> and uh, I know we all have a few minutes left here, and I really appreciate 
uh, your time. But in thinking of uh, our experience in the United States, in Iraq and Afghanistan in particular, and not having the best second phase type of a plan, um, what do you see as the next phase of the plan in Gaza? Obviously, military planners in Israel and politicians in Israel are uh, have they watch what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan as well, uh, shifting policies and, uh, and and failures and more money. And what lessons do you think they're taking from that and, and applying to what comes next in Gaza? Because they're certainly aware that there is a, a day two, for lack of a better term. Well, 20 years ago, when I was just a historian and not anything else, I, I was called in to testify in front of the Congress about the Iraq war. And I... Um, you know, not necessarily coming from a progressive background, I was against the Iraq war because I, I said, you know, if you want to go in and blow up Saddam Hussein, be my guest, but don't get involved in state making in the Middle East uh, because the British tried it and they lost their stomach for it and left and the French tried it. They lost their stomach for it and left. You're going to lose your stomach for it and you're going to leave and you're going to leave us with it with an Iranian border, which is 800 miles, you know, to the west of where it is. And it's pretty much true what I said, unfortunately. Um, but keep in mind, Iraq and Afghanistan are far away from the United States. Uh, Gaza is right next door to us, and um, we can't afford to pick up and go home because we actually are home. And um, and these people, you know, you you could pull out of Iraq and Afghanistan, being pretty confident that the Iraqis were not going to like overrun Utah. And uh, but we can't be right. We can't do that. So <laughs> the idea is not to get involved in state making, but we're going to have to have some security presence there. I mean, I would like to internationalize it. I think that the important thing is to internationalize Gaza as a problem. Clearly, it's not just our problem, it's the world's problem. And maybe have some type of international force or an international Arab force. Um, Netanyahu has come out against this, but I, I remain, I think we should we should examine it. Uh, we have to demilitarize the, the strip. We have to make sure there's no more rockets there. We have to create a, a cordon around the strip about two miles deep where nobody can get into that, that area. That's a no man's land. This notion of coming up to the fence, what they were doing, no more. Um, so we can do a lot. Listen, let's be honest. We can't get rid of the idea of Hamas any way that the United States could get a, I, get rid of the idea of Al-Qaeda or the idea of ISIS. But let's give credit. Though the United States didn't have a great plan B for Iraq and Afghanistan, you did very much degrade Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS so that they do not present the type of threat that they did, you know, back, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And listen, there are lots of neo-Nazis running around, too. But as long as there's not a Nazi, Nazi Germany, these neo-Nazis don't have much power. So you take out the, the center of the power, the state power, you can degrade them a lot. And uh, none of the things perfect here. So I, I think that we're going to have to be tough. We're going to have to stick this out. We cannot go home. All right. There's no you know, ending. We are in a forever war, if you want to put it in America terms. But that forever war is not going to end for us. Um, or else we can just pack up and go with ever. But uh, it's interesting, um, you know, here at, uh, at Columbia, there's been a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism here. And um, I hear from Jews around the world now that with everything that's going on in Israel, with the bombs falling and this, and the, they feel more secure in Israel than they feel in their homes. And that that's shocking to me, you know, because we, we live in southern Tel Aviv. And we're under rocket fire every day, but they feel more secure in Israel than they do at home. That's a pretty bad situation. Uh we are, we're going to win this, Jack, we're going to win it, but it's going to be, it'll be tough, but I'm, I'm convinced we'll win. And in a couple of minutes we have left here, uh, normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia, so Israel, Saudi, U.S., uh, how do you see that moving forward? Is that just on pause for? Uh, for pause now. Now. Yeah, the Saudis, the Emiratis, all these Gulf states have a, a bit difficult situation because on one hand their population is a very you know agitated pro-palestinian uh but these governments understand that they are wedged between sunni extremism in the form of hamas the muslim, the muslim brotherhood and shiite extremism which is iran and hezbollah and there's only one country that's fighting them both and that's us and we're the only country that's technologically advanced in the region um they gotta have relations with us so they have to right now they're putting things on hold they're issuing some very bad statements about us, but we understand that they basically have to because they're afraid of internal revolts. They're not democracies, right? So I think, again, when we win and we show that we are strong again, uh, the Saudis will come back to the negotiating table. That's what precipitated, or I think that's what precipitated the war to begin with, was the American attempt to reconcile Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, very much scared the Iranians. Um, they were afraid that the Saudis would get nuclear weapons. Uh, they thought 
thought Israel was divided. They thought America was weak. Uh, they could take advantage of this. Um, I was the night before the war started. I was in Dallas giving a talk like this, and my theme of my my talk was uh, war is coming, and this is why. And you know, there's only one thing worse than being a false prophet, and that's being an accurate prophet. <laughs> the night before, wow. yeah. So that can depend on what you're what you're predicting there. Um, wow, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. When when you think about uh, well, let's say United States, let's not go, but or Europe. What are what are the the, the one thing or the things that you would like the population to know about Israel or you wish they understood about uh, the region in general um, for people that that maybe haven't studied their history, that don't have a foundation, that are basing their uh, perception or, or their, or by the way, they're going to cast a vote on someone else's tweet who also hasn't put the requisite time, energy, and effort into studying the issue and the history and that don't have that foundation other than to build that foundation, um, what what do you wish that that let's say that that high school student, that college student, not necessarily ones out there that are protesting, but just in general, what do you wish that the United States uh, knew about the region in Israel specifically? That um, the Jews of Israel are indigenous. This is our homeland. All the place names in this country even behind the Arabic place names, is Hebrew. You got a country named Jordan that comes from the Hebrew word Yarden. And uh, Jerusalem, these are Hebrew words. Um, and this was our homeland. Um, they'll say, the, you know, our, our, our opponents will say we're a white col colonialist settler country. It's, 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 you know, get this one. The, the majority of the population in Israel came from the Middle East, came from North Africa. They were kicked out of their homes by, by Arab countries. Um, and, uh, so we are indigenous and we will fight for our homeland. Uh, when and not, There's no other society like this. This is a society where 60 to 80% of the population comes out and volunteers during this war, picking fruit, serving in hospitals, bringing meals to soldiers. Um, when we had a call up of the reserves, the, some of the, the, the units, all the reserves reported 100% call up, but some of them report, reported 150% call up, uh, which is really, I mean, who, who has a country like this that's going to go out and people fight? And it's not just like reporting the duty to guard a, a shack, it's to go out and pick up a gun and fight for your country. Um, and so these are, we have a population that is deeply committed and willing to stand up and fight. And that's what I want them to know. Um, I have a, uh, just, just parenthetically, I have a sub stack a, uh, called Clarity. It's free. You can sign up for it. And you, you, uh, you'll get insights to everything that's happening here. And I think you'll get insights that you won't get in any other uh, in the Western press anywhere. No, thank you. I didn't know that. I'm going to I'm going to definitely check that out after this Substack yeah. clarity. I, I no, thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate that. Um, and if, one thing I think the, the enemy forgets, Hamas forgets, Hezbollah forgets, is, Iran forgets or don't understand or don't care because they just want to push Israel into the sea is that it's not like the French in Algeria. There's no France to go back to. It's not like the oh. British in Kenya. There's no UK to go back to. You're there's no other choice for Israel. They tell, us to go, they tell us to go home. They don't get quite get it that we actually are home. <laughs> there is no other home. And yeah, we're not going anywhere. And we'll fight and we'll win. We will. Well, thank you for taking this time today. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, this book, your other books, I'm going to get the other ones as well. And other than your books, is there anything uh, in your, your sub stack here? Are there any other um, books that you recommend that people read to add to that foundation of knowledge or to start building that foundation For of sure. knowledge um, that they can hopefully turn into wisdom later in life? Is it, um, well, I, I, my other two, I recommend the other two books uh, of my books. I have a number of books, but there's two books that are important here. One is The Ally Book. Um, which uh, is, it's a memoir, but it tells the story of Israel. And there's another book about the history of America in the Middle East uh, called Power, Faith, and Fantasy. Um, they're all they're all New York Times bestsellers. They're, you know, I think they're good page turners. If you want a general history of understanding the idea of Israel, I recommend a book by my best friend, Yossi Klein Halevi. Uh, and it's called Letters to a Palestinian Neighbor. It's very interesting. In a series of neighbors, he lives uh, along the border. And he imagines writing these letters to a Palestinian and explaining who we are to a Palestinian. And it's a, it was also a New York Times bestseller, and it's a great book. Wow. I'm going to pick that up right after this. And uh, thank you so much again for taking this time today. I sincerely appreciate your insights. And uh, and I'm thinking about all those people that that you know right now that are, uh, that are in harm's way. Oh, so, yep. uh, 
Great. Thank, thank you so much for having me. No pleasure. Absolutely. Take yeah. care. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. I want to make sure you got your All class right. on time. Thank you. Like Will do. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Michael Oren, be sure and follow him on Twitter at Dr. Michael Oren. Check out his Substack Clarity and pick up his books, Ally, Power of Faith and Fantasy, and Six Days of War. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you got something out of this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there, stay safe, be strong, keep fighting.